Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, Mary Stein and Thomas Arst, Editors, Volume 3. This is the last essay in the book. It's found on page 369. Dr. Eisenstadt's essay in this book is The Quest for One's Own Red Book in the Digital Age. Stephen Eisenstadt, PhD, is Chancellor, founding president of Pacifica Graduate Institute and ex officio board of trustees member. He is a professor of depth psychology with a PhD in clinical psychology, a licensed marriage and family therapist in clinical psychology. His book, Dream Tending, describes multiple applications of dream work in relation to health and healing, nightmares, the world's dream, relationships, and the creative process. His website is www.dreamtending.com. I'm going to read from the end of Dr. Eisenstadt's essay first, and then go back to the beginning. So the last page of Dr. Eisenstadt's essay reads, when embarking upon a meditative reading of the Red Book, something other is needed. Before opening the cover of Liber Nobis, take heed of the wise counsel that Hillman and other Jungian mentors have offered. Open yourself to night mysteries and suspend yourself in a state of not knowing. Turn to a council of soul figures and ancient ones. Place the closed red book in front of you. Listen closely to what awakens in your psychic reality. Then receive the images, ideas, and hints that come forward. Let the images and figures find each other and exchange their regard. Then settle in and listen for an invitation. At first, we might be intimidated and ask, what if no one invites me in when I make the request? Here, again, we must turn to Jung's light. Above the doors of his family home in Kusnacht is this Latin inscription, Vocatus acte non vocatus deus aderat. Called or not called, God will be there. Once summoned, open the Red Book and read slowly. Allow the words and figures to emerge from the pages and greet you. Follow the phenomenology of experience and the poetics of imagination, not simply your rational mind. As you immerse yourself in a slow and reflective reading of the text, watch, listen, and absorb the interplay and interactions between images. Pause at the open spaces in the text and allow images to come forward and announce themselves. Here we are. Meet the emergence with an aesthetic eye, noticing what animates the interior as well as the surface. Our personal red books would make visible our own unique journeys of becoming. In the process of tending our dreams and imaginal realities, we would receive hints from the images and figures evolving from the autonomous psyche. Hints of what is, but also intimations of what is intended for us and can be realized. Through comprehending the dark, the nocturnal, the abyssal in you, you become utterly simple and sleep down into the womb of the millennia and your walls resound with ancient temple chants, since the simple is what always was. A dream, or a dream-inspired opus, such as Jung's Red Book, desires to be approached poetically, rather than advanced on rationally. Animated images, when given time and regard, illuminate They tell their deeper stories and offer their radiant endowment. How glorious would it be to vivify Jung's journeys in the Red Book and to thrive ourselves in the magical place where the spirit of the depths and the spirit of the times are one. Can you imagine? This is an 
essay by Stephen A. Eisenstadt. The Quest for One's Own Red Book in the Digital Age. Quote, if your creative force now turns to the place of soul, you will see how your soul becomes green and how its field bears wonderful fruit. Unquote. C.G. Young. Introduction. There are real threats to our existence and well-being in this world and in the worlds behind and beyond this world. Toxins and pollutants are wreaking havoc with our environment and our health. Earthquakes, forest fires, floods, hurricanes, and other natural disasters ravage one portion of the globe or another with blinding frequency. Through it all, we are swept up in a perfect storm of scientific and technological advancements that has produced cars without drivers, computers with soaring IQs, watches that administer EKGs and email them to your doctor, and space centers with the potential to launch humans into galactic orbit. Meanwhile, back on Earth, millions of people feel more alone and spiritually impoverished than ever. Embracing the Red Book as a personal meditative journey can help us better envision our places in a multi-dimensional universe and reconnect us to the abundance of our unique genius, that seminal soul spark sourced in the animated psyche. The Red Book offers neither answers nor solutions, but rather pretends an arrival, a surfacing of creative imagination and the emergence of the possible. This discussion of the relevance of Jung's Red Book and helping us to nurture the spirit of the depths in tumultuous times unfolds in three parts. The first is an account of my life's work in the praxis of dream tending and the ritual of digs, which are Jungian inspired journeys into the inner reaches of the psyche. In the second section, I offer perspectives on how the genius and vision of Jung's Red Book can illuminate the inherent paradoxes of advanced technology and help us deal with the ever-growing omnipotence of our cyber world. Lastly, I share reflections on the Red Book as a tool for personal exploration into the depths of one's own relationship to psyche and offer suggestions as to how one might embark upon the enlivening journey. Let me begin with how most things begin in imagination and dream. One, dream tending, a portal of journeying. Quote, dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Why should I henceforth not love my dreams and not make their riddling images into objects of my daily consideration? The spirit of the depths even taught me to consider my action and my decision as dependent on dreams. Dreams pave the way for life, and they determine you without you understanding their language." Unquote. My early experiences with the transcendent have shaped my life's work, my approach to dreams, and the praxis of tending illuminated images. These same experiences have offered me a living relationship with the visions and ideologies of the Red Book. Tending to dreams began for me at the tide pools on Zuma Beach outside Los Angeles when I was 12. A rock jetty on the beach extended into the sea and separated the North Beach from the South Beach. The North side was a public beach, which was popular with families. A sentry of lifeguards stood equidistantly across the beach next to a massive paved parking lot and a dozen food huts. Looming out into the sea, the rocky reefs served as a great divide between north and south. The north beach was supervised and civilized. The south beach was a mystery. The accepted rules of order stipulated that no curious kids should ever venture over to the other side. I was troubled, 
Were there people on that beach? I wondered, and if so, why are we not allowed there? When the tide was at its lowest, one could simply walk over the exposed jetty to the south, and on a family outing one hot July day, my curiosity got the best of me. After the towels had been laid out, swim gear donned, and sunscreen applied, I quietly slipped away and wove through the crowds to the reef. The tide was out, and I walked over the point and jumped down onto the sand. I looked all around me, taking it all in. Glistening tide pools appeared in every direction. The receding waves had exposed long lines of brightly colored iridescent coral, and hundreds of sea anemone and starfish still trembling with life dotted the beach. There were only a few people lying on the sand farther down the coastline, and they were all naked. That made quite an impression on this pre-adolescent kid, too, but paled next to the kaleidoscope of dazzling marine life surrounding me. Sitting down on a rounded piece of sea-worn coral, I watched and listened to the teeming activity in this majestic corner of nature's universe. Mesmerized, I was suspended in time, but was startled to attention by a voice behind me. Did you know that the rocks can talk? The words were haunting and prophetic. I was speechless. Who was speaking, and how did he know? I did not think that anybody other than I could hear such things. I turned around to see that the prophecy emanated from a surfer in his late teens, a god of the highest order to a 12-year-old. He smiled at me and walked on down the beach. As I returned to the living energy of the tide pools, his transcendent utterance permeated the atmosphere. Having had their soulful eloquence affirmed by the other, the animated voices around me became more expressive, and my hearing was sharper. Eventually, I was jolted from this psychic communion by an earthly reality. The tide was coming in. In a minute, the reef would be underwater. I leaped up and sloshed through the rising tide pools, scrambling over the flooding jetty. As I hopped off the reef and landed safely on the civilized side, I breathed a sigh of relief. My parents awaited. Steve, where have you been? My mother asked. For me, this was all too, for me, this was an all too familiar question. What could I say? I have been to a place where gods exist, where rocks can talk, and where the landscape has stories to tell. No, this explanation would fall on deaf and suspicious ears. Here on the civilized side, where food stands, parking lots, and lifeguards secure the beachscape, rocks do not speak, and the ocean and her creatures remain mute. Dream tending is rooted in the realization that at multiple levels of psyche, everything is dreaming. The creatures, the landscapes, and all things in and of the world. The inner subjectivities of living things, their particular soul sparks, their voice, and their pleas appear as images in our dream life. When we take the time to listen closely, as I did that afternoon long ago on Zuma Beach, the inscapes come to life in new and wondrous ways. I have come to see and hear these living dream images of the animated world in the actuality of their being, not just my own. I have discovered that when tending dream or reading the Red Book, what matters most is not what I see, but how I see. When we engage different modes of perception, we ask new questions, our inquiries originating from the other side of the rational mind, from the other side of the reef. The explanatory yields to the experiential. Who is visiting now and what is happening here evoke an imploring imagination, and they are much more interesting questions than the prosaic 
familiar rational queries, what does this mean and why did this happen? I remember as a child, high play invited the world to display itself in magic, mystery, and beauty. When I met these wonders with an innocent, poetic eye, the world responded poetically. It was only when I went into my head, encouraged by school and fueled by the new miracle sciences of the times, that I seemed to go deaf and blind. Adults were working so hard trying to make sense out of it all that they failed to see the inner luminescence of all being, the human made and the nature made. In the Red Book, Jung notes, quote, and when you sleep, you rest like everything that was, and your dreams echo softly again from distant temple chants. You sleep down through the thousand solar years, and you wake up through the south, and you wake up through the thousand solar years, and your dreams, full of ancient lore, adorn the walls of your bedchamber. Unquote. Animated images come to life when given attention and regard. They tell their deeper stories and offer a lustrous light from the inside out. During this quintessential process, two essential questions arise. What is the dream's desire and who journeys now? These queries move the dream work and discovery in a distinctly vertical descent down, further still, into deep imagination and into explorations that I have come to know as the digs. The digs, journeying and deep imagination. Underground, down under, in the worlds below the world. I have come to observe that the numinous, for the most part, has been banished from above ground viewing, not destroyed but forgotten, not lost but abandoned. Only as an adult have I come to fully remember and see with new eyes the psychic radiance that sparks all creation. Over recent years, and particularly after my reading of the Red Book, I have made my way back to the home place of the illuminated imagination. The downward expeditions of the digs may be incubated during struggle and strife or apprehension and fears. However, my inaugural descent did not germinate in a state of personal or professional crisis. Although the plunge was down, vertical and deep, the initiation itself was spun by insatiable curiosity. Similar to my youthful passions on Zuma Beach, I was driven by a desire to rediscover the unknown in the known. My inaugural dive into the depths began not in a sacred ceremony deep in the Amazon rainforest, but rather in one of the small ubiquitous coffee houses in the Pacific Northwest in the town of Everett, Washington. I sat in the cafe with my journal to do what I most often do with my dreams. I write them down. The dream the night before had been a simple showing of a scene rather than a major announcement or revelation. The tableau was of a bubbling creek behind a shopping mall in the California neighborhood that I grew up in. Between coffees and homemade pastry, I sketched the locale in my journal. As I drew, visual images opened up. The creek came to life, animated by a remembrance of the actual creek bed that I had visited secretly when growing up. I drew a circle over and again. It became denser and more spiraling, inviting a journey down, down below the brook, into the wet sludge at the bottom. The earth pebbles and soil beneath the creek were unfamiliar, very different from the underwater sand and seas in which I had spent a lifetime free diving and exploring in oceanic dream time. A portal was opening into foreign geologic places, and I was reluctant to go there. I hesitated. This is dirt, not ocean. How mundane, I thought. 
There is not much life in this inanimate landscape. I packed up my journal and left the coffee shop. That afternoon, a friend and mentor encouraged me to return. A portal has presented. Now go explore. So in the white night of the Pacific Northwest, when the evening light softens but never quite gives way to darkness, I sat at the same table in the same coffee shop and began the geologic dig. Down I drifted, weightlessly, into the vast expanse below. A rock formation at the familiar childhood creek had become a portal into an awe-inspiring underworld. Once landed, I was face to face with others, fellow journeyers or emergents as I have come to call them, were streaming in from far and wide. Many who arrived were elders and mentors. Others emerged from the lands of the dead in the forms of ancestors and ancients, immortals of the deep soul. There were long familiar figures too, the personage of a forgotten lover, dream animals that had lingered in my imagination, and soul companions of dreams who had afforded wise counsel over many years. My companions on the creek dig were friendly. Greetings all around. It seemed like a reunion, and I felt privileged to be included. After everyone was introduced, the procession continued to descend, and we were directed into caves where a guide told us that to go deeper, to see the worlds behind the world more clearly, we needed to be grounded in skeletal resonance. Before you go further, you must feel it in your bones, he said. We began an embodied singing and chanting the songs of the dead. I felt my body soften and my breathing deepen. I looked around and was relieved to see that my companions were also transforming in ways that made safe passage possible. I remembered Orpheus had been put to death for being unprepared for his underworld journey, and I did not relish the same fate. What I witness next will shape my work with others, particularly the next generations of students and family members for the rest of my life. From the caves, we were led into the catacombs, a dazzling place of light, where a galaxy of shimmering gems and crystals served as lenses through which we could see into the deep imagination without upper world light. These worlds beyond the world revealed a stunning display of what was, what is, and what will be possible. In the Red Book, Jung says, because I have fallen into the source of chaos, into the primordial beginning, I myself become smelted anew in the connection with the primordial beginning, which at the same time is what has been and what is becoming. My digs continue to this day, each one delving deeper around and through the unknown, the unseen and the uninhabited dimensions of deep imagination. The landscapes in my initial explorations were mostly familiar to me, places that had been cultivated over years in the practice of active imagination. As they continued, the digs descended to new and unfamiliar expanses beyond the known and oceanic. During these voyages into the depths, I am not alone, nor am I leading a team. The success of any dig is inseparable from the guidance and grace-filled presences of the others, the co-journeyers. In each pilgrimage, I am joined by new and unexpected figures. Look there in the distance, other entities approach, indigenous to the world of pain. Emergent are among the most vital companions on these underworld treks. Some of the formidable presences I've met include Vulture, who knows the fear of death, Left Out, Rejection's sultry twin, and Kali, the enraged. The synergism of the digs gives voice to darkness as well as light, anger as well as joy, alienation as well as communion, 
pilgrimages into the abyss can join the horrific and the beatific, as well as other polar opposites that thrive in the world above. In the Red Book, Jung addresses this inseparability of goodness and evil in the spirit of the depths. Quote, I understood that the new God would be in the relative. If the God is absolute beauty and goodness, how should he encompass the fullness of life, which is beautiful and hateful, good and evil, laughable and serious, human and inhuman? How can man live in the womb of God if the Godhead himself attends only to one half of him? Unquote. Every time I descend further into a dig, I am opening myself to the imagination matrix, the dominion where soulful discoveries are nurtured and thrive. Like the universe itself, the imagination matrix reveals the psychic dynamisms of all being and all non-being. I do not know who or what will show up in, on a dig, just as I do not know what birds will fly above me in the light of a daytime sky. The personalities, animals, and landscapes of the underworld have their own lives, and they move in and out of my sight in their own time. Unlike the constructed algorithms of the programmer's code, or the avatars in a computer game, the figures and manifestations that flourish in deep imagination have an unpredictable spontaneity, and when they do come forward and announce themselves, I am surprised. The theater of the depths presents dramatic and restorative shows that entertain as they enlighten. I have been privileged over these past years to be able to take a quantum leap, or more aptly, a leap of faith into learning the ways of illuminating dream images. By peering through the translucent screens affixed to the imaginable bodies of dream images, modes of perception have opened that allow me to see a metaverse of interacting soul sparks and to hear a symphony of song lines reverberating in dream time. Engaged in the praxis of dream tending and digs, we must meet the embodied dream image with our imaginal or archetypal ego bodies, not our rational minds. We use our senses. We touch the ocean. Is it warm, cold, or freezing? We taste and smell the seawater. Is it tropical or arctic? Ocean enters the room with us, not as a category of thought, but as a living, autonomous, embodied image of the dreaming psyche. Through the transcendent, we can discover our transparency. Through dream tending and the explorations of the digs, we become permeable. We find our places in the translucent fields of the deep imagination where we are connected to more than what exists out there, and we experience a recovery and awakening of uniquely intimate places in here, just as the psyche knows no bounds other than those that have been placed on her. The matrix of imagination is a free-flowing channel to the infinite. The sky is the limit, and the earth opens into the vast depths of inner space. Part two, New World Technology and the Red Book, Perils, Possibilities, and Mixed Realities. Quote, he whose desire turns away from outer things reaches the place of the soul. If he does not find the soul, the horror of emptiness will overcome him, and fear will drive him with a whip, lashing time and again in a desperate endeavor and a blind desire for the hollow things of the world." Unquote. Caught up in a technological monsoon, we are experiencing constant torrents of advancement in global communications. Daily, we interact with an international cyber community that contains billions of websites, processes trillions of gigabytes, and transmits millions of emails per second. 
Our lives, work, and relationships rely on an ever-expanding collective of internet information and entertainment. Given the amount of time we occupy in cyberspace, our time in the dream space becomes ever more diminished. Humanity has crossed a threshold in which, on average, we spend over 51% of our time living in cyberspace. For those in their teens and 20s, that number is above 75%. Given this technological maelstrom, many of us fear that cyber technology and artificial intelligence is threatening to supplant psychic life and imagination altogether that programmed counterfeit images, products of artificial intelligence, are threatening the psychic home ground of the living images that are expressions of an autonomous psyche. Will our reliance upon technology altogether usurp our spontaneous imaginal lives? Will authentic imagination eventually succumb to computerization of all sorts, including the algorithmic manipulation of a marketplace whose single-minded intention is profit-making. Jung noted that to become a knower of the human soul, one must hang up exact science and put away the scholar's gown and wander with human heart through the world to experience love, hate, and passion in every form in one's body. In today's high-tech frenzy, for example, Online time is supplanting the song lines of dream time. Psyche finds herself an endangered species, a forgotten muse. Her poetry, her wisdom, her otherness are diminishing presences. When she does come forth, speaking through dreams or cultural arts most often, her voice is commandeered and channeled in service to the next YouTube stars or cultural trends, which, in the end, do not become truly big, real, or legit until they have sent a slew of bottom lines into orbit. Today, the Jungian influence practice of dream tending holds that not all dream images are created equally, because not all dream images are harvested from the same loam. Dream images that emerge from the spirit of the depths have been gestated and birthed in the deepest chambers of the imagination, and they make manifest the Neoplatonism of the Mundus Imaginalis. In contrast, the avatars and computerized images of cyber reality are designed and created from the Aristotelian logic of programmers' codes. While writing this essay, I had a dream in which I saw myself carrying a gun and climbing up two circular flights of stairs in a modern building located in the sleek, high-rise commercial sector of New Tech, Los Angeles. My strides were purposeful, mechanical, and virtually programmed. I got to the top floor, opened an office door, saw four robotic figures, two males and two females, and pulled the trigger, shooting them dead. I had no emotions. The act felt clean, efficient, and final. The next day, I was troubled. What deep fear and rage had created these automated beings? More disturbing, what dread had turned me into their cold, calculated assassin? Was my soul engaged in a life-or-death battle with cyber technology? As much as I gladly joined the technological tidal wave every day, relying on it for personal and professional communication and information, I still often feel that I am frolicking in the devil's sea. Is my imaginative self, like the tenor of my voice, being replaced by mechanistic, robotic avatars who are simply carrying out the digital instructions of a programmer's code. That afternoon, I went to a video studio for a nine-hour taping, introducing my praxis of dream tending. Greeting me was a film crew of 10. There were no shortages of cameras, lights, or screens. Highly talented young people were running the studio, 
and they were astutely aware of the need to meet an exacting set of technological requisites in the making of the film, including search engine optimization, keywords, and digital repurposing. During the first hours of the taping, my robot assassin role in the dream was still haunting me, and I could feel that distress compromising my effectiveness in front of the camera. Then a surprise. In a break between director's cuts, my heart softened and something other nestled in, a remembering of what brought me to this high-tech studio, fully staffed by millennials who think, breathe, and speak in megabytes. I truly love this generation of young people. I appreciate their intelligence, wit, and agility, particularly technological. And I am touched deeply when they share with me their yearnings, often of vocation and belonging. I enjoy tending their dreams. Guiding them in this way reminds me how the spontaneous psyche, offering image and sensation, opens the humility of our humanity. Even as we are surrounded by screens, handheld and otherwise, we are tending dreams. Although we are not really offline, we have opened ourselves to sharing the expansive breadth of Psyche's beauty. In the midst of the spirits of the time, we are tending the spirits of the depths. Soon after the day of taping, I had a welcome visit from the woman with many screens, a regular emergent from my dream time. Her cyber wisdom and benevolent techno presence cast for the light on the darkness of the robot killer dream. Woman with many screens first appeared three years ago. In the dream, I was sitting by a bucolic lake and she beckoned me to join her. Together we traveled through vast imaginal space and landed in her community. Once there, I relaxed and looked around. I had never before seen so many computer screens in one place. The pervasive mood was one of revelation, peace, and creative energy. Every screen was a looking glass through which one could view all aspects of their inner and outer lives. From compassion to competition, from love to hate, all was revealed in their techno-translucent screens. In Woman with Many Screens' neighborhood, the projections admitted empathy and understanding, misunderstandings, territorial conflicts, anger, and shame gave way to collective harmony and mutual regard. I was fascinated by the thousands of live computer screens. The atmosphere was humming. Individuals communicated to one another verbally and through their translucent computer screens. These cyborgs were living in a blended, harmonious community with capacities for love and compassion far beyond our own. They were more humane than humans, and upon waking, I felt an overwhelming sense of awe and deep regard. Sound utopian? You bet. And what a place to visit. I've come to feel affection for the kind and expressive faces of woman with many screens and her hybrid computerized neighbors. This thriving cyber-human community has helped me recognize that rapidly advancing technologies need not be dire. If we are vigilant about integrating advancing technology with the inner realities of dreams, imagination, and personhood, there is no threat to the depths of the spirit. Upon waking from this most recent visit to Woman of Many Screens vibrant community, my first thought was, maybe our contemporary dilemma is not a matter of technological threat, but instead could be a matter of technological evolution, in which cyberspace offers another complementary dimension of a new, extending dream space. Woman with Many Screens has been a frequent companion in my daily digs, and her affable cyber presence in my dreams is a stark and enlightening contrast to my recurrent fears in the waking world that our imaginal lives are on the brink of a high-tech takeover.
her presence is particularly reassuring to me because in today's world, in one way or another, we are all cyborgs. A luminous god, woman with many screens, traces a lineage reaching back to the ancients, yet her wisdom imbues light into the present and future. Her visions make it difficult to divide today's technological universe into incompatible opposites, good and evil, dark and light. Advanced technology and deep imagination can coexist and enhance each other as dream images become increasingly hybrid, some being both technological and imaginative. We must embrace the human mechanical and psychical as one. I am reminded of Joseph Campbell's observation that simultaneous levels of existence function in concert the corporeal of waking consciousness, the spiritual of dream, and the ineffable of the absolute unknowable. Each autumn for over 30 years, I have traveled to the big sky state of Montana, where I offer a week-long dream-tending workshop and retreat at the B-Bar Ranch. The retreat unfolds in the deep imagination of the open mountain landscapes. The natural beauty that surrounds us greatly enhances our art projects, storytelling, music, dance movement, yoga, as well as the tending of our dreams. This last fall, an early snow fell over the valley, making the bright yellows, radiant oranges, and fiery reds of the changing leaves even more dramatic. The panoply of color added its drama to our dream-sharing experiences. In one session, as I worked with a dreamer, the others listened while writing and drawing in their journals. There were a number of young people in their late 20s and early 30s, and most of them were chronicling their thoughts and experiences on tablets and iPads, for some today's journals of choice. After the formal dream work, others were invited to come forward and share their art and reflections. One young woman showed us her interpretation of the living, moving, imaginal figures in the dream that she had drawn on her iPad using an Illustrator app and program. The animated images were alive, vital, and three-dimensional and the figures were accompanied by an audio of the song that the dreamer had mentioned hearing in the dream. In a word, the whole visual interpretation was breathtaking. The dreamer was deeply touched. Thank you so much, she said. No problem, the artist replied. By the way, what is your email? I'm sending it to you right now. The Red Book has its own unique technological coming out story. In 2010, shortly before the original Red Book manuscript made its West Coast debut at UCLA's Hammer Museum, Pacifica Graduate Institute hosted a weekend immersion symposium in which experts gave presentations describing some of the many advanced print technologies that have been used to preserve the integrity of the original Red Book manuscript for W.W. W. Norton's publication. Highly advanced computer technologies have been utilized to faithfully restore and replicate the print, images, and artwork in Jung's original journals. Without the implementation of this extraordinary high-tech computer technology, the genius of the Red Book, which Jung described as the prima materia for a lifetime's work, might never have been preserved and made available to us. Cutting-edge software and highly advanced print technology have played leading roles in delivering Jung's enlightening reflections from the Red Book to the world. Countless visitants in dreams possess a hybrid quality that originates from the confluence of cyber and innate sources. Virtual realities are becoming increasingly more sophisticated creating computer avatars that are sentient and sympathetic. Virtual images and psychically generated images are less distinguishable and more interactive with each other. The question is posed, 
can avatars that exist in virtual and augmented realities be experienced as living images of dreams and imagination? Can the spirits of the depths in the Red Book be illuminated technologically as avatars to reveal the blood soul of Jung's original phantasmagorical world in an interactive, multidimensional experience for today's readers? No, I suspect not, but only not yet. Part 3, Closing Reflections, Embarking Upon One's Own Red Book Journey. Quote, The way is within us, but not in God's, nor in teachings, nor in laws. Within us is the way, the truth, and the life. Unquote. In what ways can Jung's excursions into the spirit of the depths, as named in the Red Book, be applied to today's increasingly technological world? How are the symbols and mythical figures that emerge from his underworld excursions germane to our modern high-tech, outward-facing cyber reality? What would today's Red Book look like? How would it evolve? How could the unfathomable depths of the imagination in the Red Book come to life in a Silicon Valley-centered universe? I believe that if Jung, at least the Jung who lives in my imagination, had a wish, it would be that each of us would create our own Red Book, that we would receive inspiration and guidance from Jung's expeditions into the spirit of the depths and then take the deep dive ourselves, writing, drawing, and describing the images, figures, symbols, landscapes, and events that emerge from the opus of our own encounters with the psyche as they orchestrate our underworld explorations. All too often, we reduce the wondrous to the causal explanations, and the magic disappears and goes underground. Perhaps better to read and experience Jung's Red Book as a dream rather than a textbook. In his journal, Jung lets the images take the lead. He meets them in their world and allows them to display themselves and tell their stories. Images first, explanation second. The ancients devised magic to compel fate. They needed it to determine outer fate. We need it to determine inner fate and to find the way that we are unable to conceive. The study and clinical applications of depth psychology has been the mainstay of my adult life. It provides a template, a psychological, emotional, and cultural map from which I can begin to discern and understand Jung's spirit of the depths in the spirit of the times. Depth psychology is the inspiration for and foundation of Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, California, a school that I established in the mid-1970s with the assistance of other Jungian-inspired visionaries. Opus Archives and Library at Pacifica Graduate Institute holds in perpetuity the works of Joseph Campbell, James Hillman, and Marion Woodman, all of whom were ongoing presences at Pacifica for decades, teaching in the classroom, meeting with faculty and staff, and generously offering me advice and consultation in developing and tending an institute of depth psychology. At Pacifica, the pedagogical legacy of these luminous mentors lives on forever. Tenacious and disciplined and determined, one of our mentors, James Hillman, was driven to follow the arrows of ideas, pressing the known while embracing the unknown and the unknowable. His classroom presentations, essays, and books stand as testaments to his daring in describing the indescribable and attempting to articulate the psychologically real but inherently ineffable dimensions of underworld consciousness. When the story of the Red Book's discovery, restoration, and publication was told during a weekend symposium at Pacifica, James Hillman and Sonu Shamdasani 
held a seminar in which they read passages and dialogue from the Red Book and addressed the meaning and role of those particular passages in the oeuvre of Jung's thought. Then they invited each of us to reflect upon the passage's relevance in our own explorations of the deep psyche. To meet the dead, Hillman said, required not a day world point of view, but instead a sojourn through underworld consciousness. And to embark upon that journey, we must die into the realm of the Eternals, a sentiment that echoed Jung's reflections in the Red Book. Peace and blue night spread over you while you dream in the grave of the millennia. Before entering the places of the visitants of Jung's psychic world, his Mysterium Conjunctionis, we would do well to companion with an immortal who is active in the alchemy of our own imaginal depths, and then introduce ourselves through the entities of our soul's longings. When embarking upon a meditative reading of the Red Book, something other is needed. Before opening the cover of Liber Novus, take heed of the wise counsel that Hillman and other Jungian mentors have offered. Open yourself to night mysteries and suspend yourself in a state of not knowing. Turn to a council of soul figures and ancient ones. Place the closed red book in front of you. Listen closely to what awakens in your psychic reality. Then receive the images, ideas, and hints that come forward. Let the images and figures find each other and exchange their regard. Then settle in and listen for an invitation. What if no one invites me in when I make the request? Here again, we must turn to Jung's light. Above the doors of his family home in Kusnacht is this Latin inscription, vocatus acte non vocatus deus aderat, called or not called, God will be there. Once summoned, open the red book and read slowly. Allow the words and figures to emerge from the pages and greet you. Follow the phenomenology of experience and the poetics of imagination, not simply your rational mind. As you immerse yourself in a slow and reflective reading of the text, watch listen and absorb the interplay and interactions between images. Pause at the open spaces in the text and allow images to come forward and announce themselves. Here we are. Meet the emergence with an aesthetic eye, noticing what animates from the interior as well as the surface. Our personal red books would make visible our own unique journeys of becoming. In the process of tending our dreams and imaginal realities, we would receive hints from the images and figures evolving from the autonomous psyche, hints of what is, but also intimations of what is intended for us and can be realized. Through comprehending the dark, the nocturnal, the abyssal in you, you become utterly simple, and you sleep down into the womb of the millennia, and your walls resound with ancient temple chants, since the simple is what always was. A dream, or a dream-inspired opus, such as Jung's Red Book, desires to be approached poetically rather than advanced on rationally. Animated images, when given time and regard, illuminate. They tell their deeper stories and offer their radiant endowment. How glorious it would be to revivify Jung's journeys in the Red Book and to thrive ourselves in that magical place where the spirit of the depths and the spirit of the times are one. Can you imagine? Oh, I've been reading from an essay from Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst, editors, volume three, and that was an essay by Stephen Eisenstadt. Stephen Eisenstadt, PhD, is chancellor, founding president of Pacifica Graduate Institute, 
an ex officio board of trustees member. He's a professor of depth psychology with a PhD in clinical psychology, a licensed marriage and family therapist, and a credentialed public school teacher and counselor. He has served as an organizational consultant to companies and agencies worldwide and teaches extensively. Dr. Eisenstadt has explored the potential of dreams through depth psychology and his own research for more than 35 years. His dream tending methodologies extend traditional dream work to the vision of an animated world where the living images and dreams are experienced as embodied and originating in both the psyche of nature and the psyche of persons. His book, Dream Tending, describes multiple applications of dream work in relation to health and healing, nightmares, the world's dream, relationships, and the creative process. His webpage is www dreamtending.com Why are we not allowed there? <laughs> Sorry, I know what's coming. I've read this, so. <sighs> I was troubled. Were there people on that beach? I wondered, and if so, why are we not allowed there? and hundreds of sea anemone and hundreds of s that they failed to see the inner luminescence of all being. Hi, Sean. Yes, you're absolutely right. Sean says, if you can return a tyrant back to the sleeping child, then you will know how to heal some of the world's greatest difficulties. Absolutely. Okay, reading on. Sean says he found a cool quote by Mother Teresa. In the silence of the heart, God speaks. If you face God in prayer and silence, God will speak to you. Then you will know that you are nothing. It is only when you realize your nothingness, your emptiness, that God can fill you with himself. Souls of prayer are souls of great silence. Yep. That's a, that's a very good one. And the beatif and the beat beatific. <laughs> be, beatific. Okay. Pilgrimage, well, <laughs> sorry, sometimes these things get a little tongue-tying, and the beat, of, and the beat, the theater of the depths presents dramatic and restorative shows that entertain as they enlighten. I, I read that sentence to my wife, and her comment was, we're doing active imagination all the time, but we're doing it wrong. <laughs> a remembering of what brought me to this high-tech studio, fully staffed by millennials who think, breathe, and speak in megabytes. One young woman showed us her interpretation of the living moving imaginal figures in the dream that she had drawn on her iPad using an Illustrator app and program. The animated images were alive, vital, and three-dimensional, and the figures were accompanied by an audio of the song that the dreamer had mentioned hearing in the dream. 
In a word, the whole visual interpretation was breathtaking. The dreamer was deeply touched. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, she said. That underneath uh, the description of this video, you'll find a link to a three and a half minute video about the making and digital recording of the Red Book, and I urge you to take a look at that video. Can the spirits of the depths in the Red Book be illuminated technologically as avatars to reveal the blood soul of Jung's original phantasmagorical world in an interactive, multidimensional experience for today's readers? No, I suspect not, but only not yet. Okay, and I, I would just say that I've been thinking about <laughs> creating such a thing, and I think it's quite possible even right now. But anyway, that's uh, just a thought of mine. What if no one invites me in when I make the request? <laughs> and especially after I bought the $150 book. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't resist. <sighs> Allow the words and figures. How glorious would it be to revivify Jung's journeys in the Red Book and to thrive ourselves in that magical place where the... Sorry. Can you imagine? Miles says, this technology makes it easier than ever before to share our stories and create our red books to reveal more of the unconscious. Absolutely. Skip's red book is on his channel and archetype and action works. Yes, <laughs> it definitely is. Now, now up to 981 videos in the last three years. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Uh, Patricia says, everyone would benefit by having the Red Book in the house. Very, and Sean says, very cool reading. I think that that's true. And I think it's a, it's a very powerful book. Uh, I got it as a Christmas present. I can't remember whether it was 2009 or 2010. It may have been 2010 because I maybe didn't hear about it right at the beginning. It's always been a very powerful book for me ever since.